Hear now this reading from the book of Exodus. In this way, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. The Israelites had done everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases. The covering of tanned ram skins and the covering of fine leather and the curtain for the screen. The Ark of the Covenant with its poles and the mercy seat. The table with all its utensils and the bread of the presence. The pure lampstand with its lamps set on it and all its utensils and the oil for the light. The golden altar, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense and the screen for the entrance of the tent. The bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the finely worked vestments for ministering in the holy place, the sacred vestments for the priest Aaron, and the investments of his sons to serve as priests. The Israelites had done all of the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. When Moses saw that they had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded, he blessed them. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Well, harvest feasts of thanksgiving were commonly celebrated in early America. But our current holiday stems most directly from the National Day of Thanksgiving, declared by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 in the midst of the Civil War. Here is the substance of that proclamation. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict while that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union. Needful diversions of wealth and strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The ax has enlarged the borders of our settlements and the mines, as well of iron and coal as of the precious metals, have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege, and the battlefield. And the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed fit to me and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged, as with one heart and one voice, by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens, 
And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience. Commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In the midst of our greatest national conflict, a period of prolonged suffering, President Lincoln called for this country to seek forgiveness for our sins, pray for those in need, and to thank God for the blessings we have received. In the midst of war, destruction, and death, Lincoln wanted us to make time to consider the blessings that God had given us. It is a reminder that even in the darkest days, we can look for the signs of the blessing of God. And the same was true of our pilgrim ancestors, who celebrated that first harvest meal with our Wampanoag ancestors, because they themselves had been through a most difficult time pain and suffering. Their first winter had been quite severe. Many of them had died of hunger. It was only after the natives taught them how to fish for eel and to grow corn that the pilgrims were able to provide enough food to survive. So after that first harvest, they celebrated together. Edward Winslow wrote that the purpose of that first feast was so we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labor. And of course, people forget that eel was on the menu for the first Thanksgiving. In Exodus 39, the people of Israel have gathered together to seek the Lord's blessing. And they're bringing the fruits of their labor, the, all the artistic elements that they have worked on that when combined will create the tabernacle of the list of items has something of a mesmerizing effect, inviting our imaginations to picture all the beautiful furnishings and the vestments. Robert Alter writes, the language of this passage has an incantatory or quasi-musical function, evoking in gorgeous syllables the sheer splendor and artisanal perfection of the sanctuary. And so these items are assembled together. We are told that this occurred on the first day of the first month of the new year. And so for the first time, everyone can see the work that everyone else had done, see everyone else's gifts and artistry. And together, they have created something of great beauty. Moses saw what the people had done, all of their work, and Moses blessed the people and their work. Scholars have pointed out that the construction of the tabernacle models the story of the creation of the world in Genesis chapter 1. For example, when God is first giving Moses the design plans for the tabernacle, it occurs in seven speeches. Seven speeches that align with the seven days of creation. So, for example, the final speech is the speech about observing the Sabbath, to rest just as God rested on the seventh day of creation, after God's work, the people are supposed to work, rest after their work of creation. And in the passage I read a moment ago, we can also see the parallels to the story of creation in Genesis. Because at the end of God's work of creation, we are told that God sat back and looked at everything that God had done and said that this is very good. Now, after all the work of the people, Moses, God's prophet and agent, looks at all of the work of the people and declares it good and blessed. The biblical scholar Terence Frethine points out that the emphasis upon creation does not cease with the gathering and the assembling of the tabernacle that first time. Every time the people move about the wilderness, they have to 
disassemble the tent and its furnishings and carry them with them and when they make a new camp, put it all back together again. So every time they move, every time they put it back together, they are reenacting the creation. And in doing so, they are recreating themselves and God's place in the world. Plus, the worship that is carried out in the tabernacle is another form of creation. Fretheim writes that the worship of God at the tabernacle is a way for the community of faith to participate in the divine creational work. God's continuing work in and through the worship of Israel is creative of a new world. So in the midst of the wilderness journey, after their deliverance from slavery in Egypt and the trials and temptations of the desert, the people recreate themselves by these acts of giving and imagining and designing and building and putting this work together. In this way, they are transformed, awakening the image of God within themselves as together they are shaped into God's people who will bring the message of salvation to the world. Now, scholars tell us that these stories of the tabernacle were written down centuries after they supposedly occurred. They were written down while the Jews were exiles living in ancient Babylon, after the Babylonians had conquered the nation of Judah, destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem, and taken them captive. In the midst of that era of suffering and displacement, the people tell these stories transformation, of community building, new creation. These stories work to inspire that generation of Jews to survive their exile, to hope for a better future. Walter Brueggemann writes that the worship in the temple and its visual image in the tabernacle and its visual images represent a counter world to Israel's lived experience, which is dangerous and disordered. The counterworld offered in the tabernacle holds out the gift of a well-ordered, joy-filled, peace-generating creation. He then says that this explains why the passages are so detailed. No wonder Israel took such care to get it right, he says. Again and again this week, as I explored the commentaries on this passage, the emphases were twofold that this is a story of people participating in God's creative work, and that this is a story told in time of difficulty in order to help the people carry on. So this ancient story fits well with our American stories of Thanksgiving. In the midst of harsh life on the Massachusetts coast, after much death and suffering, the people gathered to share the fruits of their labor to give thanks to God for the blessings they had received. And in the dark days of the American Civil War, as every town and village and family had in some way been touched by loss and death, President Lincoln invited the nation to reflect not on the darkness, but on the good things that God was bringing to them even in that time. So I invite you, this year, as you prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving, be mindful of these examples. Look for the signs of blessings in your own life and in the world around us. And let us bring the fruit of our labor so that it might join together in the worship and the work of God with all of our sisters and brothers, that we might be transformed, that we might be God's people, that we might have the message of salvation for the world.